What's going on smart people? We're all physics majors here, except for those of you who are studying something else. And as a physics student, got the physics degree, did the physics research, now a grad student for physics, I am by my computer 24 seven, which means there needs to be things that I can access at any point in time that way I'm not just constantly searching for things. So needless to say, I have a lot of bookmarks on my computer. I thought a cool idea for a video would be to show you guys exactly what I do have bookmarked. So let's just jump right into it. If it sounds like I'm rushing this video a little bit, I already recorded it and then I realized I forgot to turn the microphone on. So let's get started. These are the ones that are front and center, things that I can access at any point in time, not because they're the most important, just because I never bothered to cycle things around, but this is just gonna be our jumping off point. And then as we go forward, we'll go into the other bookmarks and I'll just X out of these and create newer ones. Okay, the first one, Python book. This is a basic book on how to do things in Python from, as th from things as simple as calling functions, printing to screen, uh, reading and writing things to, to a file, just your basic Python operations. I've just had this on my computer forever. We go over to the next tab and this is all things in Python relating to math and things like engineering and physics. So you've got your uh, you've got your linear algebra, interpolation, optimization, differential equations. This is a pretty useful link, I would say. Most of these I'm going to link in the description for you guys to access, just the more helpful ones or the relevant ones. Um, moving over, so if there's anything I forget how to do in Python or if I need to see an algorithm that I normally don't have to use, I normally check this thing out. Next one is Quarks and Leptons, an intro introductory course in modern particle physics. This is the go-to, the universal, conventional textbook for learning quantum field theory, at least if you ask anyone from one or two generations ago. And it holds up. I think that's the reason why. Is it's a really gentle introduction to quantum field theory, and it goes all the way through topics of like QCD, which is why I think the people who I've asked uh, what quantum field theory books they recommend, they've recommended this one because they've all been people who did research in QCD. Since then, I've moved on to a more, not bigger and better textbook, but just a more tangible one just because I like to have something in my hands. It's also a different textbook, but I like both. I love this book, and I'll leave a link in the description so you guys can check it out. Next one, speaking of doing math in Python, one of my favorite algorithms for solving differential equations, more specifically ones that look like the Schrodinger equation, because that's really kind of the only one we solve at this point, is, uh, is Numeroff's method. Another really conventional one to use is RK4, Rangakata, fourth order. Um, I'm just more familiar with this one because it was the method that I was told to use for my senior thesis for solving the Schrodinger equation for this wonky ass potential for my senior thesis. And it's nice to be able to reference. I think it's a really easy algorithm to implement. Next, we're getting into more detail things for Python, where it's not actually the code itself, but more of the formatting and the display. I like to do all my Python coding in Jupyter Notebooks. I know I'm going to have to transition over soon to, I think, Jupyter Labs, because I think Notebooks is being discontinued or something like that. But I think it's supposed to be a very similar format. Uh, but what I like about Jupyter Notebooks is you have your code, but then there's also different cells, there's different blocks where you can um, explain your code. You can have a whole bunch of text and equations that are formatted in LaTeX and different colors of the fonts and it's really customizable so that you don't just have to do the hashtag, this is my comment thing. So this is really useful to use uh, if you wanna, cause I mean, displays is kinda, it's important. It's not the main focus of whatever code you write, but you want whatever you do to be understandable by other people hopefully. So I think this, this gives you the option to explain what your code is doing or, you know, in a, in a pretty user-friendly way. Using Interact, whenever I do, um, I do a lot of plotting, I would say. Most of my projects have been really plotting oriented. Uh, and I like my stuff to not just have to be input this variable. Now run the code again and input it for this variable to be this value now. I'd rather someone be able to have some toggleable slider where they can slide the variables, slide something that they want to see how it changes the plot, and then have it update in front of their eyes. So that's why, and, and when it comes to this kind of stuff, it's you know exactly what you want to say, it's just a matter of remembering what the specific function is, or what the specific uh, uh, variables you need to pass to it are, so this is a nice reference. Sometimes you might want to just have like a drop down menu, I remember that being here too. Yeah, you can drop down things, which is nice. Um, I tend to stay away 
from things like Matplotlib sometimes and IPy widgets just because of the nature of how it creates plots. It uses a static PNG, which means that every time that you update the plot, you have to call the function again. You have to run the code again. And that could be really time consuming if you want a huge amount of resolution in between your slider. So if you're going from here to here and there's a thousand points in between there and it's calling it every single time, it's going to take a lot of time for your, for your plots to update. But I'll get into that in the next. Also, sorry that this is so coding intensive. It's just that's the thing, those kind of function calls are the thing that I probably forget the most, the exact things to say in the code. So it's what I'd like to be able to reference just like that. The next one is just a paper, uh, a QCD paper that was useful for my internship. I probably don't even need it up there anymore. Since I started moving on from uh, Matplotlib to a different type of interactive dynamic plot making functions in Python, I started using what are called Bokeh and Hollow View. It's not complete yet, it's not done, but it had what I needed. I needed to be able to switch and turn like 10 knobs basically in a code and watch how this heat map changed if you changed all of these independently. And I wanted it to update really, really quickly. And this is what let me do the job. Some things are just backwards from how it does it in Matplotlib, which uh, you know I had to learn how to do and that's one of these tabs. Okay, let me start exiting out of these and going over to the newer batch of uh, bookmarks. And then I have, I have random stuff like um, some editing tricks and stuff like that, which isn't too important. Latex labels. For that uh, plotting library that I was just talking about, you know, you want to be able to have nice pretty fonts whenever you have a title of the graph or a legend. So this lets me use LaTeX in those, in those plots, which is nice and I would forget how to do it if I didn't have this bookmark here. Uh, next, Max, this is just, I don't even need to open this, this is just more detail stuff that I've had to use once. I probably don't even need it as a, as a bookmark. These two here are the Google Drives that I made a video on, which I'll link in the description, that have those hundreds of math and physics books that are available. And actually, I'll probably end up be taking that video down pretty soon. So if you haven't downloaded the drive and gotten those books, you might want to very, very soon. I mean, it's free. It's just kind of, it's not sketchy, but it's, you know, I should probably not have that on my channel for too much longer. So I'll probably be making that video private or something pretty soon. Greens functions examples. Uh, I had a pretty hard time initially wrapping my head around Greens functions. It's a method of solving differential equations. Um... And once I got it, I didn't want to lose it. And I know that Green's functions are going to be relatively heavily featured in e &M, which I'll be taking next semester. So I figured I might as well just keep it around for when they start popping up again. Moving on. Sometimes when my computer updates, if I fix a problem that it has and the update will install the old drivers that I had to get rid of before. So I always have to remind myself of how to fix certain problems with this computer. Math for grad students, this was just a video idea that I had that I might make in the future because it was, um, it's exactly what it sounds like. I mean, it's math that grad students in physics might need to know. So that'd be fun. Okay, what else is there? I think we're running out here. Easier weaknesses. This is, uh, this is, I play this game on my phone. It's Dokkan Battle. It's like a Dragon Ball game. And that's just one of the events that I always forget how to beat. <laughs> Anyways, moving on, then we got OBS black screen. Uh, that's another technical thing where sometimes my computer, when I'm trying to record the screen like I am right now, it'll give me problems if my computer's using different GPU, and I always forget how to fix it. Legendre transforms, when I was in classical mechanics last semester, and we were getting into canonical transformations, Legendre transforms were a somewhat familiar, but still not comfortable, uh, comfortable thing for me to, to do. I remember in thermodynamics doing these, but for some reason in my thermo class, we never really referred to them as Legendre transforms, which still made it a relatively novel, you know, math technique for me to be implementing. And since I'm terming, since I'm taking StatMech next semester, I'd rather have it front and center that way I can, or this semester actually, I'd rather have it front and center for when we start doing them again. And I think that's actually it. And then there's Cornhub. I love corn. 
And that's it. Those are my bookmarks. If you have had no exposure to coding in any manifestation, then this was probably the most boring video ever, especially if you're not familiar with Python, but that's just the majority of what my bookmarks were. And I didn't want to just be like, this is this bookmark. This is this. I want to be able to explain why I have them and why I want to be able to access them and what I use them for. Uh, but I understand that if you haven't had any, don't have like a working knowledge of Python, that this was probably pretty boring. Uh, anyways, I hope you still found it a little bit enjoyable. Let me know in the comment section if you did. And let me know in the comment section what do you have bookmarked. And I will see you guys there.